Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Poppy Harlow. I'm with CNN, and I'm joined by two pretty astounding, incredible women. Uh, joining me today, two women who are embracing technology, changing healthcare for the better, not just in the developing world, but right here in the United States. Ting Shi is with me, the founder of ClickMedx, a company that uses cell phones, digital images to advance healthcare and make it a lot more accessible for a lot more people. Also with me, uh, her good friend and someone who's worked with her on this dermatologist, Dr. Achama Ose Tutu, originally from Ghana, where they've been using this technology. Thank you, ladies, for being here. Ting, let me begin with you. Because Click Medics is has broken so many barriers for people, but this wouldn't have happened if it weren't for a competition at MIT. Absolutely. We started Click Medics out of the MIT Media Lab. It was just a class class project was to create a business that will impact over a billion people. <laughs> Just a small task. <laughs> and you know, we were quite undaunted by the challenge and thought, okay, most people have a mobile phone before they have electricity, so we have to do mobile phones. And everyone on my team really cared about healthcare, so we will use mobile phones to deliver healthcare. That's how it came about. Dr. C22, you call uh, Ting, a visionary, especially for what she's done in your native Ghana. So give us a little bit of background on how this has been applied in the field. Well, I mean, mobile uh, teledermatology has been available for over 30 years, but I think what Ting brought to the table was allowing people to use mobile technology, which has about a 98% penetration versus, um, you know, 3% 3, 3 in Ghana uh, of landlines, for people to be able to use that technology to get healthcare. The other thing I thought that was important that Ting brought to the table was how to have a sustainable model that was financially applicable, and Ting brought a lot of that to the table. It's a really important important aspect because if you don't, ha if it's not affordable for people and they can't use it in mass, then, then really what's the point? Interesting thing, you said, I wanted to start this in the place that was the most difficult to see if I could make it work, and it did. So where did you launch this, and how hopeful were you when you saw it take off? We started in Botswana, and then later on in Ghana. Botswana has about 40% HIV rate. Um, most of the people have access to health care in the main hospital. There are literally a handful of specialists. Some of them are borrowed from the United States for the entire country of 1.8 million people. So we needed to bridge the gap of not having uh, any doctor, five doctors maybe in general, and serving a huge population in a way where they don't have to travel days to see the doctor. And we were able to save a million just off of transportation costs, mm -hmm. and a lot of the patients reduced the number of days they needed to stay in the hospital because they could be cared for within their communities back at home. So one of, the, one of the questions that always comes to mind is what are the challenges? And it's interesting, there's not just challenges in terms of uh, the developing world, there's challenges in terms of using this right here in the United States where it is very important for people without health insurance, for example. If they can send a skin disorder for for example, a photo to their dermatologist, it's going to cost them a lot less than having to go in for an office visit. Doctor, you've said the technology is moving quicker than the legislation, and that's a really big problem, that basically regulators are holding this up. I think one of the big problems with adoption, particularly with physicians, is the fact that it's not being reimbursed. Um, so, you know, in order for doctors to be able to, you know, continue their businesses, they need to be reimbursed for their services. I think a lot of that has changed within the last, you know, few years. Mm -hmm. I do know one big um, teledermatology company that is probably the only telederm company that has um, a, a contract with an insurance company. So I think as, as time goes by, you're going to see a lot more of that. But there have been these two telehealth bills proposed in Congress, 2013, 2014, that have basically not gone anywhere. What can lawmakers do to help move this along? I think a lot of that also comes into showing that telehealth and remote care is legitimate from a clinical perspective and it is really reducing health um, cost of health care. So CMS Innovation Challenge, sort of similar to what happened at MIT, they created a competition or challenge for innovators and healthcare organizations to propose their innovation on how to reduce costs. Mm -hmm. A lot of the focus is on diabetes, heart disease, and that's also an area that we have pivoted to in addition to infectious diseases and dermatology. And we're seeing the applicability of demonstrating that technology can really drive down the cost of care, improve patient quality of life as well, and doing that in different ways throughout different diseases. What about India? I'd like to hear what you're doing in India and also how you get people on the ground to trust this. 
So in India, we're working with Medtronic, and what they've identified is a big problem with ear infections that affects about two-thirds of the entire billions of people in India. And what that means is people feel pain, itching, aching, and because they don't know that it's, there's treatment for it, they actually lose hearing altogether. So with Metrone, we partner with them and they have about 10 health workers in two of the states in India. And they screen now currently over 100,000 patients and got them treated to avoid that hearing loss. And what we're seeing is this task shifting whereby we can train a health worker, think that Sonny there, she's probably only had primary school education, barely literate, but she's actually able to screen a lot of patients, actually make a provisional diagnosis, and she's about 90% accurate compared to that of the surgeon's diagnosis, and provide advice for the patient and refer them and help them actually get to the treatment centers. And that's what's so incredible about the Indian program. What about, doctor, you're on board with this, sure. but you have said that, that not all doctors are, and I wonder what you think can be done in the face of any reluctance to adopt this. Again, I go back to reimbursement. I mean, with, with you know, the Affordable Care Act, we have an influx of you know, tens of millions of patients into the system. And I think as we go along, already now in some states, you have six you know, weeks to six months wait for dermatologists. So I, I think doctors need to understand that, you know, in the right format, you can be reimbursed for this properly. You can actually grow your business. For somebody like me, you know, who lives in and practices in New York City, you know, I now have reached to millions more people than just my very small practice. So I think it's very practical. What are, what are your goals, Ting, in terms of seeing this grow? I mean, you took on this huge challenge at MIT. Look at how it has already paid off. What's your goal for ClickMedics? We're seeing a lot of great results in terms of improving patient care in hard to manage diseases like diabetes, heart disease, even cancer. Even cancer? Even How cancer. does that work? We've di um, there was a nine-year-old child in China with a brain tumor, and her parents we went to all the different hospitals, didn't know what to do. So we have a second opinion oncologist network, whereby they had to translate all of their medical record into English. We submitted it through ClickMedics to the oncologist, and the oncologist was from um, you know, Duke and Cleveland Clinic, and they actually consulted on that patient, suggested on what to do for that child all the way back in China. Wow, and so your ultimate goal? Ultimate goal is to really to have one-click healthcare. Just like you have GPS to take you anywhere in the world, why can't we have GPS of healthcare? <laughs> Whether you have cancer or heart failure, you should have one-click portal to get to whatever the rest of the doctors and care that you need. Doctor, I, I can imagine some people who maybe aren't ready to adopt this saying, what about privacy concerns? Well, I mean, I think Ting can speak to the hard work that she's put, on, put into making the, the program HIPAA compliant. Just like we use our, you know, electronic medical records, it's the same type of privacy. So I don't think that there are any issues with that. And do you think it's just about getting over that hurdle and, and telling people this is the future of medicine? That and back to the um, payment model, their doctors will not adopt this unless there's some way of payment or reimbursement or incentive. Same with patients. So it's almost a supply and demand problem. And what we're looking at is going outside of the reimbursement model, mm -hmm. um, subscription models, monthly services for any time access to doctor. So we're exploring a few different payment models that can allow consumers, just like yourselves, to actually access that level of care. Ting Shi, thank you so much, Dr. Osei Tutu, thank you so much. It's nice to see this collaboration. <laughs> Great work.